Amen. I invite Sandy Wilmot now, who is our worship assistant today, to lead us in an invocation for our worship, an Earth Day invocation. This comes to us from um, Leah Shada's book, For the Beauty of the Earth, that we read during Lent as a church. Brother Fern and Sister Porcupine, choir of cicadas and altar guild of spiders who weave the fair linens of the forest, lightning bug acolyte and lector bullfrog who reads to us the lessons of God's creation as the sun sets each summer evening. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn today is For the Beauty of the Earth, an old familiar tune. Abby will play for us these verses and we on mute will sing along at home. If singing is not really your thing, that is okay. You may just want to read the text out loud as the hymn is played. Or as I suggested before, if you like to do some motions, you may do that as well. Abby. So we have been in this Easter season, maybe that just started last week, um, opening our worship with a prayer, with a psalm, and using motions to express our response to that psalm. So today our response is, uh, heaven is declaring God's glory. And this comes to us from Psalm 19. So I'm going to just stand up and demonstrate. I invite you to stand as well if that's more comfortable or whatever. 
So we're going to say heaven is declaring. This is like heaven. So you can start at the bottom and work our way up. Heaven is declaring God's glory. So you can kind of tap or clap your hand and then shake your fingers across glory. So let's do that together. Heaven is declaring God's glory. Heaven is declaring God's glory. All right, Sandy. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming God's handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach to the ends of the earth. Heaven, Heaven is declaring, is declaring God's the glory of glory. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun. The sun is like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite. Like a warrior, it thrills at running its course. It rises in one end of the sky. It circuits its complete, is complete at the other. Nothing escapes its heat. Heaven, heaven is declaring God's glory. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tongues of pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, even dripping off the honeycomb. Heaven is declaring God's glory. <laughs> Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. I invite you to okay. unmute yourself and with you. share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you, everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you all. Good to see you. Peace be with you. Everybody. Hey, James. It's good to see everybody. 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 Good to see they were probably eating. <laughs> uh -huh. Are we? I'm talking. I'm talking. Good morning. Hi, Margie. Peace be with you. Hi, Marge. Hi. Robin, are you ready to lead us in our peace song? I am. Holy, 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. Peace be with all of you. Okay, so we have a special treat today, uh, a children's mes message brought to us by Noreen. Noreen, are you with us? Let's see. Noreen, are you there? Mm. I'm here. I can hear you. Oh. oh. Okay, hang on. Now I get there. All right. Can you see me? Yes. Hi, everybody. And 
Hang on. <laughs> Good morning, children of God. <laughs> and just a minute, I might my my notes just blew away. So hold on just a second. Okay, now I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I welcome you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, I welcome you to the children's message from outdoors because this week we celebrated Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And Earth Day was created as a call to action, which is a collective effort to make changes to positively impact the health of the environment which is especially meaningful for, to Christians because it's a call to be stewards of God's creation. Now, a steward, what is that? A steward is someone who takes personal responsibility for something in their care. So a steward of God's creation is a call to be a keeper of God's earth. But, we are in isolation right now. We can't gather. <laughs> we can't gather to participate in marches to raise awareness for climate change. And we can't do, we can't gather to do things together that um, we would normally do to help clean up the earth. Or can we? We are all in isolation. And the wind is messing with my notes here. Hang on. <laughs> Together, this is a collective effort to minimize the risks of the virus. It's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, and it's doing a lot of damage to the life to life as we know it. But it's also giving us an opportunity to do something together that is making a positive impact on the environment. Isn't that the call to action that Earth Day was created for? Instead of focusing on the hardships of this pandemic, take a moment to reflect on how it's also giving us a way to collectively do something to allow God's creation to heal. I challenge you to explore the ways that God's earth is healing and take a moment to thank God for this unintended consequence of the pandemic. Let us pray. Dearest God, thank you for your creation. Help us to be stewards of your earth. Guide us down the path that leads us to continue the work we've done through collective isolation. Help us to see the good that is resulting in giving your earth time to heal, even though we struggle through this disruption in our lives. With gratitude for the beauty of the earth that is your creation, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Noreen. That was wonderful. I know sometimes we have technical difficulties and other times we have meteorolo meteorological difficulties <laughs> with the wind. That's wonderful. Great for Mother Nature to be with us in worship today. Come now to our time where we share our joys and concerns with one another. We lift up all of those concerns before God. So we'll take just a moment to pause our record his words. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Sandy, will you lead us in our scripture? Since you call upon a father who judges all people according to their actions without favoritism, you should conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your dwelling in a strange land. Live in this way, knowing that you were not liberated by perishable things like silver or gold from the empty lifestyle you inherited from your ancestors. Instead, you were liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. Christ was chosen before the creation of the world, but was only revealed at the end of time. This was done for you, who through Christ are faithful to the God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So now your faith and hope should rest in God. As you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth, so that you might have genuine affection for your fellow believers. Love each other deeply and earnestly. Do this because you have been given new birth, not from the type of seed that decays, but from seed that doesn't. This seed is God's living, life-giving and enduring word. God is still speaking. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Wise words coming to us from the letter of First Peter this morning. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, uh, Alan Betts is here to deliver our message this day. So I'm going to just take a moment to allow him to share his screen and slides. And as he's getting that set up, I neglected to mention before worship that we will have a time um, to ask questions and perhaps receive some answers on this presentation after the service. So we'll close our worship service today with the postlude, musical postlude as typical, and then take a, just a few minutes break and those who want to stay around to ask um, and ask some questions or hear Dr. Betts talk more about this topic, uh, you are most warmly invited to do that on this, our Earth Sunday celebration. So, Alan, I'll turn it over to you now uh, as you think, lead us in this message. Yeah? Thank you very much. Well, welcome to Earth Sunday. And this is the most unusual kind of talk that I'm going to give in that it's very complex. But I'm going to do it because there are a lot of issues that we have to face. We have to face them. And the COVID crisis has made many of them even more explicit. There's a copy of my slides on my website, which is just my name. And I'm going to start with this one, which is my three grandchildren digging earlier this year in January. What, and this is, there are three of them, three in age. They're two different families. All of them came here in one from one kind of crisis or another. But they're having fun. They're digging, and it's grand January. If someone had told me when I started working in garden in Vermont, which is more than 40 years ago, that this would be, this would be a year where nothing froze all winter. I would hardly have believed them, even though I'm a climate scientist. Even though we were already writing and getting reports from the National Academy, and even though the oil companies were busy trying to bury what they knew was going to happen. So take this image here. It's resilience. These are smart kids and they're being trained young. But this was, the, as I already mentioned, this was the first time that I have lived here when I absolutely know that my garden did not freeze all winter. Here's me in February and in March. There's hardly anything left in March. I, in February, I dug most of it over. But what I'm gonna talk about today is all the buried challenges behind climate change and behind the way our society runs. I'm gonna say a little bit about COVID in passing because that's illustrated many of the difficulties we have to face. 
What are our challenges? What are our responsibilities right now to each other in society and to our children and to the earth? And the basic question we actually have to face, and we barely have 10 years left at this, is whether we're going to sacrifice our children and the earth just so we can maintain business as usual. Or will we creatively transform society guided by moral values rather than just profit? And at the heart of this, which is why I'm speaking here on Earth Day, is will we reconnect to the earth? And within it, as Christians, where will we find peace and joy? So I'm going to go through a lot here, and I'm going to come back at the end to the peace and joy. So hang in with me. If it gets too much, just let it flow over you, and you can study it later if you want. But here's just a glimpse of what COVID has done to us. This is a town in the northern Punjab where the pollution dropped so low that the people were able to see the Himalayan mountains 120 miles to the north for the first time in 30 years. Just imagine you had that view on your horizon and everyone under 30 who lived in this rather poor town had never been able to see through the murk. But well, what do we do in the United States in this situation? Well, we have a government that's hiding behind this COVID crisis, prioritizing polluters over public health. It's ordered all the agencies to stop monitoring reporting air pollution as the global economy crumbles because they really don't want to know how much more healthy and clear the air is. And at the same time, roll back automobile standards and fuel efficiency standards because oil has crumbled and the oil companies desperately want us to buy more oil. Of course, lawsuits are starting. What I'm going to do in the next few slides, though, is contrast the issues that we face. The one that our society typically runs on and the one that we need if we are going to resolve these crises related to the earth and the future of our children and life on earth. One is technology will save us. We're in charge, we're powerful, don't need to change our behavior. Economics based on individual consumerism, our growth economy brings us wealth. Oil has made us rich. And anyway, inventions will power the future. Just contrast that for a moment with a very, very different view. Climate, life, and humanity are interwoven. Environmental intelligence is crucial. Community imagination and creativity is essential. This is an intergenerational time frame. And sustainability and justice are also interwoven. So what's environmental intelligence? It's that blend of natural science, social science, and indigenous knowledge that helps humans creatively interact and constructively with the living natural world. And that's basically missing at the moment because we simply exploit the environment to support corporate profits, dump the costs on the poor, the indigenous, our children, and all of life. Now this, I don't need to tell you, is a huge conscious challenge for society, but it's a key to smart com community resilience. And underneath it, our spiritual roots themselves are key. So another contrast, the Western capitalist mindset which we all have in a sense embraced, we grew up with it, we are, hear about it in many, many forms all the times, is anthropocentric, it's egocentric, and it's also fundamentally dualistic. I want to remember that. It's based on exploiting and subduing the natural world and people, and its growth was essentially based on having cheap fossil fuel after World War II, when the United States was able to freeze the price of a barrel of oil at $3 until OPEC, a barrel until OPEC rebelled. It's driving climate change, it's driving ecosystem loss. The indigenous mindset, in contrast, is the one we've been already touching on in the earlier parts of this sermon. It's how you look at the world through indigenous eyes. It's ecocentric. It has a respect for life and nature. It understands we're, it's a holistic world and our resources are all shared. It has a long-term view, not a short-term one. And typically it's not part of our educational system explicitly. But there's a conflict here. Our economic doctrine versus reality. 
we have this concept that free market, our free market promotes material growth. But what the free market really means in our society is the freedom to exploit, to exploit the earth's resources and exploit the poor, to simplify it. Regulation interferes with growth and profits. And the underlying reasons you all know that the assets and interests of the wealthy must be protected because they fund politicians. And choices must be cost effective now. The future costs can be discounted or paid for later by our children, for example. But the problem is that economics is driving climate change and the earth does not discount the future in any way. It simply accumulates the energy imbalance in the oceans. So there's catastrophes ahead. Hurricanes now, our children and all of life. And the only way of that, out of that is to realize that this is the reality we live with and we have to embrace something closer to the indigenous worldview. I don't need to put this one up, but I will so that have it the record. Our financial in interests are totally amoral. And if you look a little deeper, immoral. The reserve, fossil reserves are worth a lot of money. So of course, it's big money, we'll burn them. And the banks, the asset managers, and the insurance industries are all still busy funding the fossil fuel industry and talking sweetly about how they're changing their ways on their websites. Just capitalism, the COVID for a moment. Capitalism basically exploits people and resources to maximize profit and minimize costs. No consideration for resilience, no consideration for long-term stability, no consideration of justice for working people or for life on earth. And we're seeing many of those aspects. It's this tragedy of COVID has exposed how people and the poor particularly are basically servants with limited assets, limited health care. They're a sort of modern day slave, and I'll come back to that in a moment, especially farm workers. We've seen the collapse of our vulnerable global economy constructed under the rules of capitalism, and we've seen the exploitation in the healthcare system. What is community resilience? It's the concept where we understand we have shared local infrastructure, shared resources, shared knowledge and awareness. And we can design our communities to maximize efficiency in terms of power, renewable energy use, to consume less. We can share our food system and more localize it. We can share an efficient transport system. We can support the ecosystems long term. And this, of course, needs imagination and change. But as a contrast, it, you, many of you may know Joanna Macy, she said, our society tries to convert us into happy, isolated individuals addicted to consumerism, escapism, and the media. These are two different visions of the world. But behind this, there's another challenge. It's we have to distinguish between the human-made world, the man-made world in the old days, and the natural world. We understand the human-made world, the world of computers and technology. Somebody understands it anyway, even if we don't. Because we made it, it's predictable and somewhat controllable until it gets out of our control, as it sometimes does. But this is not true at all of the natural world. It's much more complex and it's alive. And we struggle still to understand it. And basically, prediction and control are uncertain. And this is a fundamental difference that we have to keep bearing in mind. He, uh, Fritz Schumacher, for those of you who know him, called this the created world, the natural world as the created world. Now, science has some strengths. It's integrity, it's honesty, it's communication, and it's valuable to our society, which is many times lost in ignorance and deceit. But science has limits. It can only really deal with the tangible, the measurable, and the communicable. And that makes it very hard to deal with the complexity and the interconnections of the living natural world. So trouble lies ahead. What are the challenges? We have complex living systems nearing collapse. Fossil capitalism that's based on fossil fuel is incompatible with a livable earth. There's financial, political, and social resistance to change. There's corruption in the system at many levels, and the moral issues are starting to surface. We can see we're sacrificing our children and the poor. 
species are going to go extinct along with a stable biosphere. So one of the great things that has happened in just the last year is a global rebellion has started. And you're familiar with some of this. This is Greta, 15 year old, after recovering from the trauma of realizing what was going to happen, decided she had to do something. And she simply sat outside the Swedish parliament in the fall of 2018, insisting that the Swedish government follow through on the commitment commitments it had made in 2015 in the Paris Agreement. And here's her a year later. You can see how much she grew up in just that one year. Rebellions had started before COVID. Millions and millions of people across the world. And there's a second thread here that you may be less familiar with called the Extinction Rebellion. And its a web address is justrebellion.earth that started where I grew up in England in about a year ago realizing that the destruction of the earth is now a civil rights issue. It can only be checked by civil disobedience to defend the rights, not of us, but our children and the rights of the earth. They went down to London with 100,000 people in April of last year, barely a year, a year ago, and set, simply shut down the governments until they declared a climate emergency. We heard almost nothing about it in the United States. And those actions and the thoughtfulness behind them are going on around the world. Muted at the moment, but they're going to come back. And their strategy is very simple. We're going to force large reductions in our emissions of carbon, carbon dioxide, this decade. But I want to flag something else that I, a man I had never really thought about or met uh, since I grew up in a different culture. I came across the words of Frederick Douglass. This is a speech he gave in 1857 before the US Civil War. And I want you to think about it because of its relevance now. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what people will quietly, quietly submit to and you will find out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted. Now the context here was a very profound religious one. The Jamaican Black Baptist minister, whose name was Samuel Sharp, called out 60,000 slaves on Jamaica on Christmas Day, 1831, asking just for half pay. It was crushed. He was tried and executed for treason, treason calling for some pay for slaves. It's a peaceful rebellion but the moral stand he took was so strong that it shook the British government, who'd abolished the slave trade 20 years before, but not the slavery itself because it was so important to commerce. It led to the freedom of all the slaves across the entire British empire. Think about this because it's entirely relevant to what we're seeing from the, the COVID crisis and the challenge that lies ahead. We are in a very powerful system that has people so quietly submitting to what it demands. And it will go on until we resist. So just to recap, much of Western philosophy and theology formed when humanity had a lim limited understanding of its place in the natural world. But really the structures of our belief did not matter too much because our impact was small. This change with the industrial revolution powered by fossil fuels, and now we're having a global impact on the natural world, and we have to understand our place in it. Science and technology created this, but to find our way out, we have to understand it from a moral perspective. From my own perspective, I've been a scientist for 40, 50 years, but I knew right from the beginning, science was not enough. So I, I've explored many of the moral frameworks of the world. And one thing that always puzzled me was the way in which our societies had separated church and state, state and science, and enabled the rise, this enabled in one sense, the rise of science and technology in an amoral framework, driven just by creative exploration, framed by the sense of human power and superiority, and supported by money and capitalism. But I didn't understand it was obvious to me that Christianity, that Jesus Christ was so deeply rooted in the natural world, so deeply rooted, I did not understand why Christianity had been so suppressed the indigenous worldview. So I started digging and looking, 
And I realize, which to theologians must be sort of obvious, but its significance, I don't think, was, was really appreciated by our society. And it arose out of the Council of Nicaea, when the emperor proposed a deal to the Christians who were being persecuted, redefine Christianity, a clear set of doctrines, and choose the Greek gospels that are distinct dualistic framework and a clear sense of human power. He needed imperial power over humans and human power over the natural world and suppress the holistic and indigenous Aramaic gospels. The Aramaic name of Jesus was Yeshua. So I started reading what the Aramaic gospels actually said. And I'll come back to that in a moment. This was a huge for the Roman church. They became the imperial church of Rome. They had to abandon and bury the holistic indigenous gospels. And it was a catastrophe for the Jewish and Assyrian Christians who actually understand what Yeshua, the Aramaic name of Jesus, was teaching. A million maybe died as heretics in the next century or two. And of this persecution of the Jewish Christians eventually became the persecution of the Jews. The Roman church lost its holistic indigenous roots, which we now have to recover if we want to recover a manageable, livable earth. So these are my closing slides. What is, the Pope understands this, and you should read Laudate Si if you haven't and skip over some of it, but read its beauty and see how he recognizes the need for spiritual guidance to direct technology. He explicitly discusses how the exploitation of the earth and the poor is immoral, and that the human relationships to nature and the past teaching of the Christian churches on this really have to be rewritten. But it's five years since he wrote that. And now you can see if you read between the lines that the most of the Catholic Church has been resistant to deep change. It's an institutional power conflict issue again. But what we have to do, in my opinion, is return to the indigenous mindset of the Aramaic teacher Yeshua, because it's transformative. It gives us the guidance, the creativity, and the joy we need. So in simple terms, how do you approach this? Thy will be done on earth. Thy will be done on earth requires that we understand deeply the earth, the spirit, and the whole of creation. So we can be responsible stewards of the earth. So take the creation into your spiritual practice. Take your personal savior to the creation. Find ways to put those together. What I think of as the core teaching of Yeshua, Jesus, was come with me into my world, the world of the creator, where you will see the truth of the living web of the creation, and that truth will set you free to act on the behalf of the creation. So bring the creation to your spiritual practice. Take your personal savior to the creation. We'll have a discussion later, but I want to close with a prayer. Gracious Father, fill us with thy spirit and understanding and connect us with the web of life, your creation. Help us reach out to one another in love and gratitude, generosity and courage. Together we can reimagine our society and create a path forward for the earth. Let us remember those that will come after us, our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren. Let us remember those who live in poverty and reach out to them with a grateful heart. Give us the clarity, courage, and humility to drive change so that thy will be done on earth. In thy name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Alan, for sharing with us today. Um, that certainly has given us a lot to think about, to reflect upon, and to pray through in the weeks, months, years to come. Really, that mindset shift, the change of mind, the change of heart is, is at the core of what it means to, um, to do better by our earth, by our children and grandchildren. And so as Abby plays our musical 
reflection after the sermon, I would just invite you to maybe you have a notepad or something nearby and write down like what what are the, some of the questions that you have coming from that or what part of that presentation really stuck stuck you or stuck with you um, so that we can continue to come back to those and and pray on them and act on them in the time to come. Abby, would you lead us? Amen. I also want to remind that after worship today, we will have a time to have some question and answer with Dr. Betts. So if you are available to stay around and be a part of that, that would be that would be wonderful. We come now to the time of our service where we offer up our offerings. We have online giving opportunities as well as um, the ability to send money to our, our donations to our post office box, which is 265 in Underhill, Vermont. Um, give thanks for all of the generous giving that has continued in these days. We also share um, about the ways that we give in, in terms of our own time and service to one another. So we just have a few announcements and you may have caught these right as worship was beginning, um, but we have a shortened worship service next week on May 3rd. We'll gather at 1030 Eastern as usual, but then afterwards we're going to do our hands to work, heart to, hearts to God activities. So if you have, um, if you wanna think about an activity that's about 60 to 90 minutes in length that you can do, in social isolation and beyond uh, next week as an offering to God and neighbor. Um, 
we'll we'll do that together apart after worship next week. Uh, and then on May 10th, we'll have our Mother's Day celebration and quilting part one. Youth group tonight at 7.30 as a reminder. United for Justice will be this Wednesday at 5.30. Contact Sandy for login instructions for that one. And we will, in that setting, continue the conversation uh, that we have been having today. Also, um, adult education series is starting up in, on Thursdays in May. So if you are looking to learn a little bit more about um, Christianity, past, present, and future, and or if you are interested in becoming a member of this community, um, or just even refreshing your, your membership vows, your vows of faith. This series uh, is for you. It's a time to come and learn a little bit, refresh a little bit, and then especially on that June 11th day, um, if you're interested in becoming a member of our church, um, we'll have a new members orientation and you can reflect upon whether um, whether this is, is the time to, to make that commitment um, and, and joyfully join this wonderful community of faith. Those are the announcements from my side. Are there others for the good of the body that you would like to share? If so, please unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm gonna have a birthday slide here and, uh, and share that with the body. And uh, just a reminder, church council meeting is on uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. My apologies for the multiple emails I sent out that had both the wrong date and the wrong time in them. And I appreciate uh, Roger Gilman, Bill Frank setting me straight on that. Thank you. Yes, I forgot that one. And I believe that means listeners is also on Tuesday, 630, perhaps. So. Thank you, I forgot those ministry announcements. Okay, well then I would like us to go ahead and sing our birthday song. So as a reminder, we have uh, once a month on the last Sunday of the month, we sing the special birthday song and we honor those who had a birthday uh, during that past month and we um, often give a special thank offering, which then goes into our quilting ministry. So you can give to that quilting ministry online. Just go as you would regularly give online on our website, look for the birthday bank line, and you can make a special donation in there. And I'd encourage you to use the chat uh, in this worship service. If you or someone you love has had a birthday in April, you can put that in there while we all sing along at home on mute our birthday song. Abby, would you play it for us? Also then lift up in Thanksgiving for all of our offerings, our gifts and our service, um, this uh, doxology. Noreen? Sure. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And our prayer of dedication. Sandy, can you lead us in that? God of earth and air, sea and sky, we thank you for the gifts of life that move within and around us as we seek to grow in reverence of all creation. Accept these gifts and let them be agents of healing and restoration. We pray this in the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. So again, uh, as Abby plays for us, encourage you to sing along on mute or you may read the lyrics out loud along on mute.
I'll send us forth again with these words from First Peter. Live in this way, knowing that you were not liberated by perishable things like silver or gold from the empty lifestyle you inherited from your ancestors. Instead, you were liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. We are liberated. We are free. In Christ, we know the freedom that makes possible powerful mindset shifts. And so go forth into this day, into this world, knowing that God frees us and empowers us for powerful change and does not abandon us to do that work alone. The grace of our powerful Lord Jesus Christ, the love of a wonderful creator God, and the communion that draws us together of that Holy Spirit be with us this day and even evermore. Amen. I invite Abby to leave us to lead us in our postlude, our final musical piece today. And then if you would like to stick around for some question and answer, we'll have time for that after our service. Abby. <laughs>